So as we're probably aware, you know, we have uh, doctrines at our church. There's, uh, I think it's 13 primary doctrines at our church. Um, and the, the doctrine I'm going to be preaching on today is uh, point 11 of the doctrines of our church, Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And the doctrine reads, uh, we believe that God created the world in six literal 24-hour days, approximately 6,200 years ago. Uh, so today, like I said, I'll be preaching on the age of the earth. Um, so if you guys want to turn to Genesis chapter 1, 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that'll start us off, that'll kick us off for the sermon today. Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. The Word of God reads, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that's the title of the sermon to, today, brethren. Uh, God created the heaven and the earth. God created the heaven and the earth. Not the rainbow serpent, not the ancestors, not the Big Bang, not the United Nations. God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. So this sermon, brethren, it's going to be broken up into basically three parts. Okay, uh, The first part, I'm going to be going through the references in Scripture. I'm going to go through it really quickly. Um, because it does quite, take quite some time, my, my family found out last night. So I'm going to go through uh, the easy parts really quickly. Just a couple of side notes on some difficult parts in working out the age of the earth, I might make a bit of mention on, okay? Um, so the first point, I'm going through the references in Scripture that reveal the age of the universe, according to God's Word. Then I'm going to address some common objections that we would get here in Australia. I'm going to try to specifically um, address those ones that I feel we would get in Australia. Um, and then the last point, the last point of the sermon will be the ultimatum of both faiths. Because, see, you either believe there's a God or you don't. You either believe there's a God or you don't. And that faith, that belief has consequences. I'm going to go over that at the end there, just to show the importance of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. So you guys are in Genesis 1 there. So I'm going to uh, read that again. I'm going to go to verse 5 as well. So verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Jump it down to verse 5 if you can there, please, brethren. And God called the light day, and the darkness called he night, and the evening and the morning were, look at this, the first day. The first day. So that is the first day of creation. The first day of creation there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. If we can jump over to Exodus. So sorry, guys, what I'm going through these verses for is I'm going to lay the foundation of what the, uh, what the sermon is going to be about where we get our faith from, where we get our belief from, why we believe it was created in six literal days, about 6,200 years ago. So we see there in Genesis 1, that is the first day of creation. So if we can go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, please. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. So that first part there, it says that God created the heaven and the earth on the first day of creation. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. The Bible reads... For in six days, in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and look at this next part, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. So we see there not only did God create the heaven and the earth, first day, God created the heaven and the earth, and all that in them is in six literal days. Everything we see and feel and touch and it's all been manipulated to create different things like cars and that kind of thing. But all that material was created in six days. Six days, the Bible says. Jumping back now again, please, brethren, to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 23. So God created the heaven and the earth on the first day of creation. He created everything that is in heaven and earth in six literal days. Genesis chapter 1, verse 23. Starting in verse 23, the word of God reads, In the evening... It Sorry, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So all before that, that's been five days. Okay, let's go to verse 26. Because this is on the sixth day of creation. Verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Jumping down to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Jump down to verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, God had made. And behold, it was very good, 
and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we see there, God created the heaven and the earth on the first day. God created everything that is in heaven and the earth in six literal days. And the last reference he just went to there, God created the first man on the sixth day. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 19, I'm just going to make reference really quick. We don't have to turn there. We see that the man's name was Adam. The man's name was Adam. So yeah, God created heaven and earth. See that all that in there and all that in them is in six literal days. God created the first man on the sixth day. First man's name was Adam. All right. So now we can pretty much start because like six days, God created everything. So we can start from the first man and count how many years it's been since creation. Now, it doesn't matter. Look, I've, I've gone through this and you guys can go through it yourself. I've given you, so that sheet I've given you there, that's got all the references that I've pretty much turned to to give me um, all the information to, to prepare the sermon. You go through it yourself. You are not going to, you're not going to get an exact year. It's really difficult, okay, going to the Word of God. But it's, it's nothing, uh, you don't come up to anywhere near 65,000 years, just so you know. All right, so we're going to start from Adam. Now, now we don't have to turn there. I'm just going to go through it really quickly because this, this can take quite some time. I'm going to try and rush through it as quickly as I can. So from Adam to Noah... Now those references, as you see there on the sheet of paper, it's in Genesis chapter 5, and it goes from verse 1 to verse 32. So Adam, to, so Adam was 130 years old when he had Seth. Seth was 105 years old when he had Enos. Enos was 90 years old when he had Canaan. Canaan was 70 years old when he had Mahalalil. Mahalalil was 65 years old when he had Jared. Jared was 162 when he had Enoch. Enoch was 65 years when he had Methuselah. Methuselah, 187 years when he had Lamech. Lamech, 182 years when he had, had Noah. So then you've got that first number that I've given you there, and that I get to 1,056. The, the, 100, the, the, sorry, the thousandth and 56th year was when uh, Noah was born. Noah was born. Now this it gets a bit tricky in this part. It's not too hard, but it gets a bit tricky. Um, so, now we're going to look at before and after the flood. So if you turn to Genesis chapter 7 verse 6. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6. So I've got 1,056 years so far. So Genesis chapter 7 and verse 6. The Bible reads, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were upon the earth. So Noah was 600 years old when the flood came, when God judged the earth by water. Now, you don't have to go back there. I'm just going to say it really quickly. Genesis chapter 5, verse 32, it says, And Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We should know this. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the three sons of Noah. The reason I make mention of that is because we're going to be looking at Shem's son to continue on to, to add up and calculate how old the earth is according to the word of God. Okay? So turn to Genesis chapter 11 verse 10 if you will please. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Remember Shem was the son of Noah. Shem was a hundred years old. Right? That kind of throws you off but this is the number we're looking for here. And begat Arphaxad said when? Two years after the flood. So you see 600 years the flood came uh, for Noah, then two years after the flood, Arphaxad was born, okay? So we add 602 to 1056, I came to 1658. So if you put that in the box, uh, if you guys are following along, it's up to you, but if you put that in the box before and after the flood, I got to, one th uh, sorry, yeah, 1658, okay? Now this is more of the easy part coming after this. So we're going from Arphaxad, that's the son of Shem, Noah's grandson, to Terah. Okay? All right. Now, the references are there on the page, but if you guys want to go back over in your own time, but I'm just going to say it really quickly just so I can breeze through it. Arphaxad was 35 when he begat Selah. Selah was 30 when he begat Eber. Eber was 34 when he begat Peleg. Peleg. Peleg was 30 when he begat Ru. Ru was 32 when he begat Serug. Serug was 30 when he begat Nahor. Nahor was 29 when he begat Terah. Now if you add all those up to the 1658, 
I got to 1,878. So you can put that in the box there under Brother Anthony column. Okay? Now, the birth of Abraham gets a bit tricky because when you're reading the Bible, Abraham, he was born Abram, not Abraham. God gave him the name Abraham. It's kind of like, you know, Israel and Jacob. Jacob was, uh, Israel was born Jacob. God gave him that name Israel. Abraham was born Abram and God gave him the name of Abraham. Okay, so turn to Genesis chapter 11, 26. I think you guys are already in um, Genesis chapter 11, so just go to verse 26. All right. <clears throat> now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram. That's Abraham, remember? Jumping down to verse 32. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. And you're probably asking, why are you looking at the age that Terah died? Because we need to use that to work out how old Terah was when he gave birth, or when he um, begat Abraham. Okay? Now, so Terah was 205 years old. If we go to the next chapter in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 4. In verse 4, now it's a little bit in the verse, so just, just pick up where you see it. And Abraham was 75 years old. Remember, that's Abraham. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Okay, so why is that important? In Acts 7, verse... So I'm just going to go there really quickly, guys, because I do um, jump along through the verse, but I'll read it out for you, and you can check it in your own time as well. It says, Acts, it's in Acts 7, uh, starting in verse 2, it says, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham... In verse 4 it says, Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, and it's this, When his father was dead, he removed him into this land where he now dwelt. So you see that Abraham, when he was 75 years old, he departed from Haran. But that's when his father died. So he departed from there at the same time that his father died. Is that making sense? So if you take 70, so it's, Terah was 205. You take 75 from 205 you get 130, and that's how old Terah was when Abraham was born, okay? And if you add that together, I got to 2008. So when Abraham was born, we're in the year of creation, 2008. Now, just a quick reference there. Abraham, Abraham is Abraham, and that's in Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. I'll just read it out really quickly. It says, Neither shall, this is God speaking to Abraham, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy, thy name shall be called Abraham. Now, you're probably wondering why I didn't just go to, you know, when, does, what does it show in Terah when Abraham was born? Like how old he was? Now, the difficulty with that is that when it's, it's mentioning someone in the chronology when they give birth to, uh, when they have children, if they've listed more than one child, that isn't necessarily the year they had all those three children. Okay? Because if you look at, um, in Genesis, it says that Terah was a uh, hundred and something maybe, and it says that he begat Abraham, Abraham, Nahor, and all this kind of thing. But we just saw there by ca calculating and adding it up, he was actually um, was 130 exact when Abraham was born, because that's how old um, when we take Abraham. I hope that makes sense, guys. I have to check it in your own time, but I think I've been pretty good on it, all right? Now, so the year recorded, if there's more than one child, is the year that they actually started having the children, so it doesn't necessarily mean they're triplets. And you can see that with, um, with Shem. So it says Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. It says that Noah, I think it says Noah was 500 years old when he begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But if you do the math, Noah was actually 502 when he had Shem, when you worked that all out. Like I said, the references are there. Have a look in your own time, brethren. Now, it gets a little bit easier here. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, now it says in Genesis 21, verse 5, I'll just go there really quickly. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. So we add that 100 years as well. And in, to work out how old uh, Jacob was, sorry, what is it? Uh, sorry, Isaac, when he had Jacob, sorry. Uh, Genesis 25, it says here that 
Isaac was three score and three score years old. Now a score is 20. Three times 20 is 60. So Abraham to Isaac is 100. Isaac to Jacob is 60. 160 plus 2,008 is one, uh, sorry, 2,168. Okay? Now, we've got to Jacob. Now from Jacob to Egypt. Because remember, God said that they were going to be in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. I think it was 400 years or 430 years. So we go from Jacob to Egypt now. Okay? Now, you don't find out how old Jacob was um, when they moved to Egypt until he actually goes there, when the, the children of Israel went there. And Pharaoh asks Jacob how old he was. All right? And, and Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of, the, of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. Few and evil are the days of the years of my life being. So Jacob was 130 when they went to Egypt. Okay? Now, I'm going to go there really quickly to Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. It says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And then in verse 40, 41, it says that they left even in the self same day of that 430 years. So you see, from Jacob to Egypt was 130 years. And from Egypt to the Exodus was 430 years. Okay? Now, this next part is going from Egypt to Solomon. If you saw in your sheet, Egypt to Solomon. So we've got the 130 years, the 430 years. Now, turn to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So we're working out now um, up to the reign of Solomon because... At this point, we've pretty much been looking at the, the age that men were when they begat their children. But at this point now, we're going to be looking at the reigns of the kings. Because it doesn't really give us that information from here on in. But it does give us how long kings reigned. So we can continue the calculation from then, okay? Alright, so 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year, this is what it says here, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, remember? In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. So it was the 480th year after they came out of Israel. But, but see that there, that was the fourth year of Solomon's reign. So what we then have to do is take the 480 years and we take away four to get back to the start of Solomon's reign. All right? And that gives us 476. So from Jacob to Egypt was 130 years. Egypt to Exodus was 430 years. And from the, Exodus, from the Exodus to the first year of Solomon's reign was 476. You add all those up and I got 3,204. 3,204. All right. Now it gets a bit easier here, so I'm just going to go through those ones really quickly. So looking at the kings of, of Israel, which eventually become the kings of Judah, because we're looking at the southern kingdom. So from Solomon to Jeroham, one of his descendants there. So Solomon was 40 years when he begat Rehoboam. Rehoboam was 17 years when he begat Abijam. Abijam was three years. Sorry? So, so, no. This is not beginning, sorry guys, this is how long they reigned. So yeah, you can't be three years old and begin another child. So let me do that again. So Solomon reigned 40 years, sorry about that. Solomon reigned 40 years and, be, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. Rehoboam reigned 17 years before Abijam. Abijam reigned three years before Asa. Asa reigned 41 years before Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat reigned 25 years before Jehoram. And when I add those numbers together to... The 3,204, I got 3,330. And that 3,330 is the year since creation, since God made the heaven and the earth. All right. Now, we're going to go from Jehoram to Joash. Jehoram to Joash. Now, Jehoram reigned eight years before Ahaziah. Ahaziah reigned one year. Now Ahaziah was, um, I think he was killed. And Athaliah there is actually a woman, that's his mother. So his mother took, took the throne after he reigned one year. And, and Athaliah to Joash, which was the son of Ahaziah, she reigned seven years. Because one thing that this mother did, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but her son died, but her son had other sons. She ordered that all her grandchildren were killed and she took the throne. 
But the sister of um, Ahaziah hid, the, hid his son Joash, and then seven years later he came to reign. And, and the mother was, was um, yeah, I think she was uh, put to death for that, for that crime. All right? So adding those up, we've got 3,346. Now, just a couple of side notes when you do go through your own study, if you do choose to do so. Um, Jehoram, one of the, the, um, the kings there, is also spelled Joram in some instances. And it gets a bit confusing because one of the... Because remember, at this point in time, there's the southern kingdom of Israel and there's the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Joram uh, was a southern king, but, but there's also another Joram that's reigning in Israel as well. So just be mindful of that when you do your own study. Um, and also Joash, the last king we got to there, is also spelled Jehoash as well. So it can be spelled a little bit different. All right. But the way I confirmed who they were, you, you can do this easily by looking at their parents and their children. All right. That's how I confirmed who they were. Now, we're going to go from Jehoash to Jotham. And like I said, all the references are on that sheet of paper. If you didn't get one, I think there's a few up the back. And I, I can probably print some off if you guys wanted to, to have your own to look at, it, look at it in your own time. So from Jehoash to Jotham. So Jehoash reigned 40 years um, before Amaziah. Amaziah reigned 29 years before Azariah. Azariah also is referred to as Uzziah. In his, and that's another thing that makes it a bit tricky as well. Azariah Uzziah, and Azariah or Uzziah reigned 52 years to Jotham, to Jotham, okay? Now, when I added that up, I got to 3,467. Now, like I said, another quick side note here, and um, I'll just compare scripture with scripture as well. Azariah is Uzziah, because at this point, um, I think you, may, you can make it easier from going, because actually, I'm looking at the kings now, guys, so I was... I think I was in 1 Kings to start off with. Now I'm in 2 Kings. To make this easier at this point, you can go to 2 Chronicles, but I decided to stay in 2 Kings just to be difficult. All right? So, a, like I said, Azariah is Uzziah, because when you're reading through it, you can get a bit confused there. Now, the reason why I know this is because um, his father, Amaziah, was the son of Joash. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 25. All right, it says, Amaziah, the son of Joash, is talking about the father of Azariah or Uzziah. And it also makes that reference in 2 Kings 14, verse 17. Now, Azariah, his father fled to Lachish, but the people slew him there. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 27. But that's also referenced there as well in 2 Kings 14 and verse 19. Another thing about Azariah, and the reason why I could compare Azariah with Uzziah, because in one of the books his, his name is Azariah, uh, one, of the, yeah, one of the books, and in the other books his name is Uzziah. So you have to compare, compare these two things to, to work out that's the same person. The people of Judah made him king at 16. This is the Azariah or Uzziah. It says, it says um, the people of Judah took... So this is in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 1. It says... Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king. But in, yeah, but in 2 Kings 14, verse 21, it says, And all the people of Judah took Azariah, which was 16 years old, and made him king. So you see how it's the same person? They have the same father who had the same father, and they were both 16 years old. His father was Amaziah. And that, like I said, that's in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 1. But it's also there in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 21. It says his father, 16 years old, made him king instead of his father. And it says that in the same thing. But remember, one's called Azariah. One of his names is called Azariah. And the other is Uzziah, but it's the same person. Another thing, like there's too many similarities to say someone different. This is what I'm going over, sorry guys. It's taking a bit too much time. He reigned 52 years, and that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 3. But it's also in 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 2. And his son was Jotham. So this Azariah and Uzziah, they have the same father. They reigned for the same amount of time. They were both six... Like, it's the same person is what I'm saying. It's the same person, all right? 
and his son was Jotham, and you see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 23. But you also see that in 2 Kings 15, chapter 15, verse 7. All right, so like I said, we needed to work that out so we can continue to, to go on with the years um, coming on from, from Jotham. But like I said, if you want to do something, uh, make it a bit easier for yourself, you, you can follow through in 2 Chronicles. But I'm going through in 2 Kings, okay? Now, from Jotham to Jehoram. I said Jehoiakim. So Jotham reigned 16 years before Ahaz. Ahaz reigned 16 years before Hezekiah. Hezekiah reigned 29 years before Manasseh. Manasseh reigned 55 years before Ammon. Ammon reigned 2 years before Josiah. Josiah reigned 31 years before Jehoahaz. And Jehoahaz to Jehoiakim, who was named Eliakim, who was actually his brother, who Nebuchadnezzar put in place. He only reigned for 3 months. Okay? Now... After adding that up to our other total that we got, I got to 3,616 and a quarter because three months is a quarter of a year. All right. Now I'm going to get you guys to do a little bit of work here because I'm going to show you where I went from, from here. So at this point in time, you know, from, from Adam, we added up how old they were when they had their children. Then we get to Solomon, we're adding up the amount of years that they reigned. These next two parts... The next two parts yeah. is I'm looking at prophecy, God's word, God's prophecy to show the, the years following from there. So the, the, this part we're going to look at now is the Babylonian captivity. But after that, I don't know if you guys have studied the, the book of Daniel, the 70, the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's the next part we're going to use after this to add up to Christ. Because what, what I want to do ultimately, I'm telling you what we're doing. We're going to when Christ was crucified and then we're going to come back to when he was born. And then we can add pretty much 2,020 years to that to see how old the earth actually is, okay? All right, Babylonian captivity. Now, if we can turn to, because remember we got up to Joachim there last, the last one was Joachim that we got up to. Oh, actually his brother. No, no, it was Joachim, sorry guys. All right. <coughs> Now, go to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 36. See, this is the part where I think I, I could have made a mistake or it starts getting a little bit tricky, all right? Especially around the kings. So, like I said, I've got the, the reference sheet there for you guys to have a look for yourself. Maybe you'll come up with a different year. I, like, I, I don't think I come up with the exact year, but I think I got pretty close, all right? So Jehoiakim reigned, so in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 36 to 37. 36, it talks about Jehoiakim. And when you go along there, it says he reigned, he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. All right. So he reigned 11 years. That's another 11 years. But here's what makes it tricky. In 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 1, going from verse 1 to 12, it says, in his days, so Jehoiakim's days, so in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Keep that in mind. He became his servant three years. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Remember the Babylonian captivity? So he served for three years of his reign under King Nebuchadnezzar. All right? And then it goes on in verse 2. And the Lord sent against him bands going on according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Now you see that in Jeremiah. You see that in Jeremiah. So if I can get everyone to turn to Jeremiah 25, please. Jeremiah 25, we're starting in verse 1. Because Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years, but three of those years was in the service of the king of Babylon. Because I want to look at the, the prophecy here, and I want to show you why I'm, I'm making a big fuss about these three years. So Jeremiah 25, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 1 says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jump down to verse 8. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, 
Verse 11, just in the mid part of verse 11 there now. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. So you see there that the prophecy said they would serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. So the reason why I made a big fuss out of the last three years of Jehoiakim's reign is because that's part of the Babylonian captivity. So remember he reigned 11 years. We take three years from that reign because that, that was the start of the Babylonian captivity. And then we've got eight years there. Okay? So we're going to add another eight to what we've got. And then the Babylonian captivity to the Persian Empire, like the Lord says in the Word of God, it was 70 years. So we have the eight plus the 70. And when we add that to the 3,616 and a quarter, we get 3,694 and a quarter. Okay? And that's the end of the Babylonian captivity. Now at this point, I'm making an assumption. I'm coming in straight out and saying I'm making an assumption there. My assumption is that there's no gap between the um, end of the Babylonian captivity and the start of Daniel's prophecy. All right? Now the main reason why I'm making that assumption is because I couldn't find anything in Scripture to, to suggest that there's any gap or space between those two periods. All right? Now... Now, I would just mention there was the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, I believe. Um, so what is the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem? Turn to Daniel chapter 9. We'll start in verse 1. Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 1. All right. So I've had the Babylonian captivity, and like I said, I believe that I'm, I'm making the assumption that that commandment to restore Mill Jerusalem was straight after, or at the very end of that captivity. So in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, um, all right, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, verse 2, jumping through a bit there, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, remember we read in Jeremiah, the 70 years, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Go down to verse 20. Because from there to in between verse, that and verse 20, Daniel saying a prayer to the Lord. He said, And whilst I was speaking and praying, jump down to verse 21, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, Jump down to verse 22. And he informed me, so that's the man Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. So just to give you a bit of a picture of what's going on, Daniel's reading the book of Jeremiah, and he sees what we just read there, Jeremiah 25, that the, the captivity is going to be 70 years. And he knew that uh, the Israelites were under the captivity of Babylon for about 70 years. So he's, he knows it's coming soon. The end of this is coming soon. So then he says uh, this, this, this beautiful prayer to the Lord. But the Lord gives him a little bit more insight into to, to what's about to happen. All right. At the beginning of the supplication, the command came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. So this is still in verse 23. Sorry, brethren. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. Now, I just want to make a quick reference here. So when we're working this out, we're only going to the 69th week because that's when Christ was, was crucified. He was cut off, it says, but not for himself. Because remember, he died for our sins that we might be saved. Now, Quick reference here because it says to make an end of sins because there's, there's some churches out there that will teach that the 70 weeks are already ended. The 70 weeks are not ended because it says to make an end of sins. Now, is there still death in the world? There is because there's still sin in the world. All right. So the 69 weeks have been fulfilled, but we read about that 70th week more in Revelation. Okay. But I just want to make that quick point there. To make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. God's actually given Daniel the, the prophecy and, and words to, to tell him the end of the world and the, the bringing in of, of the kingdom of Christ. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
He says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, remember that's what I mentioned there, I, I believe that, that was at the very end of the Babylonian captivity, unto, so from that point, unto the Messiah, the Prince, Messiah means Christ, we know who that's talking about, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Remember, a score is 20. So three score is 60. So that's 60 and two. So it's going to be, so from the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, is going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks, all up 69 weeks. Okay? The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. But this is, and after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. But not for himself, because remember, he died for our sins. And that through faith in him, his death, burial, and resurrection, we live forever. Now, cut off, let's talk about his crucifixion, his death. Okay? So at the end of those 69 weeks, that's when Christ was crucified. Now, the six, the weeks, it talks about the seven weeks and the, and the three score and two weeks, six, two weeks, are actually, they're not weeks of days. They're weeks of years. And I'm going to show you in the Bible how the Bible uses the term week to also refer to a, a set of seven years as well as a set of seven days. Now in Ezekiel, I, I, I was going to go there, but it, I don't think it does it more justice than the next reference. It talks about God, God's prophesying against Israel and Judah for not obeying his commands and his word. Um, and he, he, he tells him to lay on his side for you know like 40 days and that's because of the 40 years of iniquity of Israel, uh, Judah and then the other side for Israel. But he's comparing days to years. So that's one thing. But I think the thing that justifies the seven weeks of, as being seven weeks of years is actually in Genesis 29. So if you guys want to turn there to Genesis 29, and we're going to start in verse 25. Alright, so again, the point I'm making now is that when Gabriel gave him that vision, and he's talking about seven weeks, in three score and two weeks, He's not talking about weeks of days, he's talking about weeks of years. So Genesis chapter 29, starting in verse 25. All right, and it's, it, we're looking at when Jacob serves Laban. Laban for, um, he initially wanted to serve for Rachel, but then Laban tricked him a bit there, so he had to serve another, it says a week here, and I'll show you in the Word of God. It says, verse 25 says, And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What? What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore hast thou beguiled me? So it says, Jacob's there serving for Rachel to be his wife. But Laban gave him Leah, and I, don't, I think he might have been under the influence of, of wine here, which is why we shouldn't drink wine. So he's, he's having a bit of a, a go at Laban for that. Let's read on. Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Verse 26. And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country. To give the younger before the firstborn. This is, fulfill her week, week, and we will give thee, uh, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So he's saying, fulfill a week, but then he's saying, yet a seven other years. Verse 28, and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So Jacob fulfilled the week, and he gave him Rachel his daughter to wife also, and Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhart his handmaid to be her maid. And when, he went, and, and when he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. See how he fulfilled the week? It was seven years. So a week, is just a, a week is just a set of seven. The context determines how long that is, whether that's a seven or seven days, or a set of seven years. We see here in Genesis it's a set of seven years. And that's how we interpret Daniel chapter 9. Okay? So, all right, all I have to say this was remember at the end of the 69th week, that's when Christ was crucified. And, a, and a, the week was a, a set of seven years. Now, a set of seven. So, 69 times seven. This is how we work out how many years after that commandment that Christ was crucified. And 69 times seven comes up to 483. Okay? So, from the commandment to restore, uh, the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Unto the Messiah, the Prince, the crucifixion of Christ was 483 years. Now, when I add that to 3,694 and a quarter, I get to 4,177 and a quarter. Okay? That was the death of Christ. 
Now, what I'm going to do is work back to when he was actually born. So how old was Christ when he was crucified? A lot of us would already know this, but I'm going to go to Scripture to, to look at that and confirm that. Now, we know from the Bible that Jesus was about 30 years. So go to Luke chapter 3, verse 21, if you don't believe me. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Luke chapter 3 and verse 21, the Gospel of Luke. The Bible reads, Now when all the people were baptised, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptised and praying, the heaven was opened, verse 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. So he started his ministry when he was about 30 years. Okay, We get that there in the Bible. Now, How you work it out is going to the Gospel of John to see how old he was because the Gospel of John records all the different Passovers that, Christ's minist- that were during Christ's ministry. Remember on that third Passover, I think, we'll go through it, sorry, I'm, I'm giving away too much. But on one of those Passovers, he was actually crusoed because he was the Passover Lamb of God. All right. Now, John chapter 2, verse 11. If we can go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, actually it's in verse... Yeah, we'll start in verse 11, sorry. John chapter 2, starting in verse 11. The Bible reads, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. I think that's when he turned the water to wine. After this, he went down to Capernaum. Go to verse 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. All right, so that's one Passover there. Okay? So I'm going to assume he's about, you could say he was 30, but I'm going to say, look, he's 31. All right? He's about 31 years here. Now, John chapter 4, verse 54. If we can turn over there really quickly, please. John chapter 4 and verse 54. So we see that before the... uh, So they had the first miracle there and then the Passover was coming up. John chapter 4, verse 54. This again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So we've got the first miracle, the first Passover. Then he performs another miracle there in chapter 4. Go to chapter 5, verse 1. So we're just following along. It's not too far, guys. It's the same book. John chapter 5, verse 1. And verse 1 says, After this there was a feast of the Jews. Now, I don't know if that was the... It doesn't say it was the Passover, so I'm assuming that could have been one of the other feasts. Because there's three main feasts in the the Jewish calendar. There was the the Feast of Passover, um, and that had 11 bread and all that kind of stuff. And then you had the, the Pentecost, and then you had the fall feast. That was the boost, the tabernacles, and all that kind of stuff. I'm assuming that could be the tabernacles. I'm not 100% sure, though. Okay? Let's go to John chapter 6, verse 1. John chapter 6, verse 1. So he's had the Passover, and then there's another feast there in, the bet- in, in between. But now we're coming to the next Passover here. It says in John chapter 6, verse 1, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Verse 4, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. I'm just going to stop there. So that's the second Passover. So we, we can, I guess, comfortably assume that he's about 32 here. All right? Remember he started the ministry when he was about 30. He had that first over, he's about 31. He's about 32 here at this point in time. Okay? Go to the next chapter in verse 2. So John chapter 7 in verse 2. This one's a little bit more clearer to show there's a a separation between the Passovers. It says in John chapter 7 verse 2, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So like I said, there was those three three feasts, right? The Passover was was in the the spring. That was kind of like the spring feast. And the tabernacles was like the fall feast. So they like at different parts of different times, different parts of the year. So we know there for sure that the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand after that second Passover. So we can go to the, the third Passover here. And that actually pops up in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Now, uh, John chapter 11 starting in verse 1. John chapter 11 starting in verse 1. Verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. So when we read on there, we see this is the miracle that Jesus performed when he rose Lazarus from the dead. 
Okay? So that's a quite significant event around this Passover. And when you look at all the references again, if you choose to do so in your own time, guys, you will see that at the different Passovers, there's different things happening. So you can tell that they're different Passovers. All right? Now, we're still in John chapter 11. I want you to jump down all the way to verse 55. Because this is after Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Um, and then in verse 53, they, it says the Pharisees, I think, took counsel together um, to, to, to discuss putting Jesus to death. Verse 55, and the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. So there's that third Passover there. And he's about 33 here. And there's something interesting about this Passover, because when we go to John chapter 12, so go to John chapter 12 and verse 1. John chapter 12 and verse 1. Bible reads, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, so that's the Passover's night hand in John chapter 12, it's six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, which, was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, jump down to verse 3, then took Mary a pound of oint, ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus. All right, and we're reading in there in verse 4 that Judas Iscariot, um, starting in verse 4 and in verse 5 Judas Iscariot says why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor verse 7 Jesus says then said Jesus let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this for the poor always ye have with you but me you, you not you, sorry but me ye have not always so this was six days before the Passover that, that third Passover was ministry but she's, she's anointing him for his burial. John chapter 13, if we can, please. Go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now, like I said, the reason why this one's interesting, this Passover, this third Passover, we, we read it here in verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father... Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So this is actually the Passover that he is um, offered up as the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All right? So we, we saw there that he, he started the ministry at about 30. There were like three Passovers in his ministry, so we can safely say he was about 30, 33, 32, if, if you want to get a bit fussy there. It's, it's one year. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't come up to 65,000 years. Now, the, the assumption that I've, I've, I've made here, I made another assumption as well, because I know a lot, of, a lot of people that work out the, the age of the earth and that kind of stuff, they go to secular texts here. But look, I'm just using the Bible, all right? So I've got to make a couple of assumptions. I'm going to lean on the Word of God. Now, my assumption here is that, you know, BC and AD are correct. Because, you know, a lot of people say, you know, he's born 4 BC, 4 AD. Well, that could be true, but, you know, where are they getting that source from? That's not in the Bible. So I'm just going to assume, all right? BC and AD are correct. BC means before Christ. AD is, uh, means Anna Domini, which means the year of the Lord. Now, there's other reasons why we, we, we probably shouldn't trust all the other the scholarships and all the, the, the texts and that kind of stuff because there was a period um, in Europe called the Dark Ages. And the reason it was called the Dark Ages because there wasn't much knowledge or information around that time. So a lot of records were actually lost during that time. So I'm going to assume that Jesus was born 1 BC, because 1 BC, then 1 AD is the first year of the Lord. Okay? Now, we know he was cut off, he was killed when he was 33 years of age. And remember, that was 483 years after the Babylonian captivity. So what I'm going to do is look at when he was um, killed, take his age away from that year to work out his birth. So remember, it was 4,177 and a quarter. So I'm going to take away 33, which being you know, 33 years old, Jesus was when he was um, crucified and died for our sins. So then I come to um, 4,144 and a quarter. Remember that three months that that king reigned for? That's a quarter of a year. So I got to, for 1 BC was 4,144 and a quarter years. That's 1 BC. Now, as we all know, we're in 2020 AD. So it becomes a little bit easier from this point in time. 
So all we have to do now is take that 4,144 and a quarter years and we'll add 2,020, uh, yeah? Okay. When I did that, I got to 6,164 and a quarter. All right. So in 2020, we can safely say God created the heaven and the earth about, like I said, you go through it and you realise yourself you can't get an exact date. <laughs> It's really hard. We've got, to, we've got to accept some of that by faith, don't we? About 6,164 years, three months and six days ago, God created the heaven and the earth and all that in them is. Now, that's the references. So like 6,100, what did I say here again? 6,164 years. That's, that's about how old this heaven and earth, this universe is. 6,100 and 64 years. Now, I said I was going to touch on a, a few common objections that we would probably get here in Australia. Now, a big question that might be asked, you know, but haven't Aboriginal people been here in Australia for more than 65,000 years? Well, then the question I would ask is, according to who? I don't remember the traditional Dreamtime story that said we've been here for 65,000 years. I'd like them to show me. Next objection might be, Oh, so you mean to say all people came from Adam and Eve? Well, yeah, that's what the Bible says. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. And Adam, and, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The mother of all living. Now, you want to know what's really interesting, guys, is that there was a, a scientific study done back in 1987. And... It confirmed this truth. If you want to look it up, mitochondrial leave. Have a look at it. So I, um, I went to the, the scientific report. I didn't look at the whole report, but I looked at the excerpt because the excerpt pretty much tells you what it's about, right? And this is what it said. All right, so a study published on the 1st of January, 1987. It says, the, so the abstract, the abstract states, so this is the abstract of the report. You know, you go into these, these scientific reports and they've got like a, abstract or excerpt of what it's all about. This is what it said. This is what it actually said. This is a scientific um, report for all those atheists out there. It says, mitochondrial DNAs from 147 people. So looking at the DNA of 147 people. That's not it though. It says, drawn from five geographic populations. So five different places in the world. So you've got 147 people, five different places in the world. They're drawing on the DNA. This is what they come to the conclusion. It says, have been analysed by restriction mapping. It says all these mitochondrial DNAs stem from one woman. 147 people, five different locations. The DNA proved in the life, life is in the blood, according to science, from one woman, Eve. Eve. If you want to look at that yourself, guys, it's a mitochondrial Eve. It's a report that was done but, um, back in 1987. And then there you might get the, the wise person that says, yeah, who did Cain and Abel marry? Well, they're sisters. I know, look, it's, it's morally wrong today, but it doesn't make it scientifically impossible. I mean, science here is saying that mitochondrial leave existed, the one mother. So that first generation, you mean to say they weren't brothers and sisters? And why is it morally wrong though? Because God's law said it's morally wrong. They didn't get that from the, from the Big Bang. God's law says it's morally wrong. Now, Genesis chapter 5 verse 4 says that, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. So not all Adam and Eve's children are listed in the Bible. It, but it does say that he begat other sons and daughters. Now, all right. Another objection you might get here in Australia. You know, they use the Bible to colonise Australia and steal the land from Aboriginal people. Well, not the King James Bible. If so, they weren't reading it properly. Because I can go to a few verses that say that shouldn't have happened. Revelation 21 verse 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now, the word holy just means separate. Okay? So Aboriginal people are living a separate life, a separate um, way of life. The Bible doesn't say there, you know, just, just 
push your own culture on. It says, live and let live in those verses. Another thing that everyone turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 17. Because look what the Bible actually says by removing your neighbor's landmark. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 7, says, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Because I know like back where, where I'm from, back up in, in Kempsey there, one thing that was used to, to identify you know, the, the, um, the country and the landmarks was, was kind of like a diamond pattern on the tree. So that was like a landmark. So what was done... Um, was not according to the Bible. The Bible didn't say that. Our job is just to preach the gospel. And Jesus changes people. Jesus saves the world. Now, another objection you might get in here in Australia would be, you know, um, well, Christianity is the religion of the white man. Yeah? How's that song go, though? Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Acts 17, verse 24, Bible reads, God that made the world and all things therein, verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations, of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. It doesn't matter what colour skin our is, brethren. You cut us open, we're all red. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus for everyone. And if you don't have Jesus, you will go to hell. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And now I said I want to touch on the ultimatum of both faiths. Because you either believe there's a God or you believe there's no God. But there's consequences for both faiths. But what they fail to acknowledge is that they have a faith as well, these atheists, these agnostics. And their faith is in the theory of evolution. Now, a theory isn't something that is, a, is confirmed. It's a, it's, a, imagine it like it's, a, it's a wonderful idea for people, right? Because once it's proven true, it becomes a law. Why hasn't the theory of evolution become a law just yet? It's not true. It's not true. Now, I went on the, the National Geographic and they talked a little bit about the, the Big Bang Theory. And it says here, the best supported theory, this is what the, 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 the scientists, uh, the, the atheists and the, 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 the professors, professing themselves to be, was it? Professing themselves wise, they became fools. Right, this is what they say. Of our universe's origin centers, an event known as the Big Bang. Here's the theory in the... I don't know what this means, but it's less than a second, apparently. Of its existence, the universe was very compact. Less than a million, billion, billionth the size of a single atom. That's ridiculous. It's thought that at such an incomprehensibly dense... So, you know, comprehensive, understand, so they, they can't understand why. So that's, that's not science at this point in time. It's incomprehensible. Energetic state, the four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear forces were forged into a single force. This is it. But our current theories haven't yet figured out how a single unified force would work. To pull this off, we need to know, not science means knowledge, we need to know how gravity would uh, how gravity works on a subatomic sub scale, but we currently don't. So they just said our current theories haven't yet figured out. They said they need to know a certain thing. They just they listed what they would need to know, but then they said they currently don't. So, so after all that, this this scientific um, explanation of the beginning of the of the universe, they don't know. Now the definition of faith means to trust. To draw towards anything, to, to believe. Now, at the point that you don't know something, you have to believe it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That's a faith that they have. They say, oh, but it's science, it's science. All right, definition of science. 
The Latin word means scientia. I think the Latin, Latin word was scientia, but this is, what, this is what science means, to know. So if they don't know how this wonderful idea of the Big Bang and the theory of evolution, how is it science when science means to know? The theory of evolution is a faith. The Big Bang theory is a faith. Atheism is a faith. Atheism is a faith. Atheism literally, literally means it's a belief that there's no God. Belief is faith. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because, you know, the first thing they'll say is, you know, I, I stick to science. I stick to science. I don't, you know, religion or faith. Or like but they have to have faith that that happened because they don't know how it happened. They just re revealed that in that little expert, that little report there, right? So why do I, I bring that point up that they have a faith and we have a faith? Because there's, there's a consequence for both faiths. So what's the ultimatum of both faiths? Let's say we're wrong and they're right. You know, we'll, we'll die, we'll degrade, we'll just, we'll cease to exist if they're right. Right? Fine by me, but what if we're right and they're wrong? They'll die and go to hell. Burning forever and ever. I'm just going to read it here because it's a sober reminder, brethren. Let's go to Revelation. You guys go to Revelation chapter 14 and, and starting in verse 9. I'm going to read from Revelation 21, verse 7 to 8. It says, He that overcometh, I love that term, that really helped me in my Christian walk. Overcometh. Well, my Christian birth, to be honest with you, when I found out the definition of that. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. If you overcometh, you are a child of God. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part, where? In the lake which burneth with, keep this in mind, fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now you guys are in Revelation chapter 14. Fire and brimstone. How long does that last for? Let's have a look. Verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. See, they... they they want to reject the Bible because they don't want anything to do with Jesus. Well, newsflash, if you reject Jesus, he's going to be tormenting you in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. In the presence of the Lamb. Do they just burn up? What does the Bible say? And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Forever and ever. Go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, if you will, please, brethren. Remember, he that overcometh will become a child of God. It says we will inherit all things if we overcometh. How do you overcometh? It also says overcometh shall not be heard of the second death, which is the fire and brimstone. That's in Revelation as well. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? I don't know. What's the better faith? If they're right and we're wrong, we're just going to cease to exist. Fine. But if we're right and they're wrong, forever and ever. Let's keep that in our hearts when we go and preach the gospel, when we have family members that have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ yet. We all have them. We all have family that need the gospel. Let's keep that in mind. It's forever and ever. And all they have to do is believe. Just believe. Faith. Faith. Let us pray.